Rouge. Matthew, the 13th chapter, beginning with the 44th verse. You know, I feel that God wants to really move upon our hearts and our lives tonight. And you know, I've had a number of people that have come to me and said, Brother Messer, I want to be used of the Holy Spirit. And I want God to do work in my heart and my life. I want to have the power of Jesus in my life, but I just don't have the liberty that I want. You know, I've often watched such individuals... And I've seen that we sometimes have a tendency not to press through to gain the victory and the power that Jesus has for our lives. Now, if you want to sit there with your hands in the pew on your hikamashai, hallelujah, and say, I can't have any liberty, I don't have any liberty, I don't have any freedom, that's why I don't praise God, you're never going to have it, church. The only way you're going to have liberty and power and freedom in Jesus Christ is when you, in spite of the devil or how you feel or any kind of an opposition, begin to open up and begin to shake heaven and say, God, I'm going to rejoice in you. I'm going to praise you whether I feel like it or not. Amen. Somebody here needs that real bad tonight. I believe we need to get a hold of Jesus at any cost because the power of God is the most worthy thing in your life. And I'll tell you something. If I felt always like praising God, when I praise God, I probably wouldn't praise Him half the time. If I felt like lifting my hands when I lifted them, I probably wouldn't lift them very often. Amen. But I'll tell you one thing, when you find a person that is open before Jesus and says, I want victory in my heart and my life, and I'm going to get it, and I don't care if I feel like praising God or if I don't, I'm going to do it anyway. And lift their hands and begin to get a hold of Jesus. It isn't long till victory begins to move. Hallelujah. God begins to get a hold of their heart because that individual has perseverance within them. They're not going to stop, but they're going to keep on going until the power of God is released upon their life. And that's what the Lord wants to do for you tonight. Do you believe that? Glory to Jesus. Matthew, the 13th chapter, the 44th verse. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a treasure hid in a field. But which one a man hath found did he hideth and for joy? Therefore goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who hath, when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Let's pray and ask God to bless His Word. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank You and we give You praise. And we honor You, Lord, for we know that Your power and that Your Spirit is present in this place tonight and that you want to do a great and a mighty work among the people of God. May our hearts be open, Lord, and our minds receptive to receive uh, that your Spirit might be able to implant into us that thing that you would have us to know tonight. Uh, And God, that you might minister to us, uh, even that our needs may be met and and your power may surge through our bodies and set us free, uh, ministering to every need that might be upon the lives of your people tonight. And God, we're claiming this and we're believing for it. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Hallelujah. You know, I believe in going in until we have what we want from Jesus Christ. Thank God for a couple of you over here. Amen. I believe in it. I believe that we ought to just get a hold of God and search and seek and knock and pound you know, it kind of blesses me when I think about the early church and how they were persecuted. And, and I know that the very reason that we have what we have today is because there were men and women that refused to take no for an answer. They refused to be discouraged. They refused to be bound. When they took them in and beat their backs until they were bloody and bruised and torn, 
Instead of coming out with the mully grubs and their face hanging to the ground saying, Oh Lord, why did you allow us to go through a thing like this? They came out with joy in their hearts and their lives saying, Thank you, brother. We appreciate the fact that you allowed us to suffer the way Jesus did. Hallelujah. And give praise unto God and magnify His name for the fact that they have been counted worthy to suffer. Brother, that's enough to get anybody excited. How can you stop somebody like that? You just can't do it. You knock them down, they get up and go on. You beat them and they just multiply and go on. Hallelujah. And they keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger for Jesus. You know, I believe in this scripture that we've read tonight. Jesus was giving us a scripture that would illustrate the necessity of being able to persevere and to search and to hunger for the things of Jesus Christ. One of the things that I love about the parables that Jesus spoke in the Bible is that He could take just a very few words and He could paint a picture that was so vivid that even a baby could understand it. Now, there's a lot of people that don't want to understand it. Amen. Every time I found somebody said, I just can't understand, I just don't, you know, that doesn't make sense to me. I've usually found there's a reason inside of their heart and their mind they just don't want to believe what God's got for them. But he made it very clear. He made it very vivid. Very easy to understand. For example, in this scripture tonight, Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a treasure hid in a field. That which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy therefore goeth, and selleth all that he hath, that he might buy that field. I want you to picture this scene in your mind tonight, and I want you to look at this man. I was talking on this very same subject in my church a few months back, and I made a terrible mistake. God helped me not to make the same mistake tonight. We were talking about sharecroppers being blessed and how this man must have been a sharecropper sharing the income that he made off the property with the man that owned it. And I have a tendency at times to get my words confused, just like Peter and John when the Bible said that they were ignorant and unlearned men. Hallelujah. How many ever heard a baby cry before? Well, if you have, don't worry about it then. Amen. And I said, praise God, this man was a sharecrapper with the Lord. So if I... Amen. I've paved the way. If I get my tongue twisted and say the wrong thing tonight and anybody laughs, so help me, I'm going to throw a book at you. Praise the Lord. I believe this man was a sharecropper. He must have been. Because the land that he was farming, obviously, was not his. He labored there. He worked there. And evidently this man had rented a piece of property or he was leasing it or a sharecropper, for instance, he would plow and, and, and cultivate the fields and plant them and then reap. And when he'd get his harvest, usually he gets 40% and his 60% goes for the rent of his property and so on and so forth. And this man was no doubt a sharecropper who had taken part of this land. And he was out there laboring in the heat of the day, plowing away with a crude plow and the instrument of work that he had in that day. He didn't have any air-conditioned tractor like we might see going across the field today with a little plastic compartment around it, all nice and cool on the inside. But he had a crude plow with oxen that were tied to it, the reins wrapped around himself. And he was plowing out there in that field and working and laboring and the sun was beating down upon his head. And he was probably thinking what a terrible, hard, difficult life it is. One day it's going to be better. One day my ship's going to come in. One day I'm going to be able to provide for my family. One day I'm going to see uh, their needs met and all the things that they've always wanted and desired. I'm going to be able to provide for them. This man, as he labors in the field and as he works away in the heat of the day, uh, 
plowing and working the hard, sun-baked soil, all of a sudden his plow stops. It struck something. And he lays down his plow, beginning to curse the soil again, thinking it was another rock that had made his hard work even a little bit harder. He puts the plow aside and he begins to dig the earth aside, getting down to remove the rock and thinking there must be an easier way to make a living than this. There must be a better way. And as he begins to dig down to the rock, suddenly he strikes it and he realizes why it's not a rock at all. It's metal. And so he digs deeper and faster to see what it is. And the farther he gets, the bigger it gets. Until finally he discovers that it's not a rock, but it's a chest. And it's buried there in that field. He finds a rock and he breaks it open and he lifts the top back. And there it is, the very thing that he has desired all his life. The thing he's dreamed of. The thing that he's prayed for. The thing that he's hungered for in his heart. Why, there's enough money, there's enough treasure in that chest to be able to provide every need that he could possibly have. Anything he could want, it's right there. And his heart begins to leap inside. At last, the thing that I thought of, but what am I going to do? It's not my property, it doesn't belong to me. Why, it belongs to the man that I'm leasing this property from. And if he finds out the treasure is here, he'll take it and I've lost the whole thing. Bible said he quickly begins to cover it up. Say, well, that underhanded, dirty old renter. Amen. He covers it back up and he makes the soil appear as though nothing had ever been there before so that nobody will see it and so that nobody will know that there's ever been any digging there at all. And he lays his plow down and he goes back to the house and he gets everything together and he begins to have a sell, sale and he sells all of his possessions, everything that he possesses. He tries to raise up enough money that he might be able to buy the field, uh, to buy the property, uh, because he has discovered something so great that he can afford to make the investment. Because down buried in that field is a treasure that will supply every need that he's ever had. Now you think about that for a moment. Then Jesus gave us another illustration. He said that the other, that the treasure, that also finding the kingdom of heaven was like a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. And this man has great pride in all the pearls that he has found. He has great joy in seeking and finding these pearls and buying them. He's a merchant. That's part of his life. He has many. He's collected them for years. He loves this uh, business that he is involved in and the pearls that he collects and the things that he does. Uh, but deep down in his mind, he has a dream of one day finding the perfect pearl. Every one of these pearls that he has, even though they're beautiful, even though they're very valuable, even though they have a great deal of meaning to him, and even though they're worth a lot, each one of those pearls has a tiny little flaw in it somewhere. And this man thinks and dreams that one day I'm going to discover one, that there will be no flaw. And his size is going to be greater than anything I have ever discovered, the perfect pearl. The perfect pearl. One day he's passing through the marketplace. And as he's passing through, his eye sees it. The very pearl that he's dreamed of, the one that he's sought for, the one that he's asked for and prayed about all of his life, there it is right before him. And as the man sees that pearl, he rushes over to it quickly and he begins to examine it. And he puts his little magnifying glass in his eye and he turns it around and he looks at it. He cannot find a flaw perfect just like the very thing that he's looked and sought for all of his life. The price is high. It's going to cost him a great deal to be able to purchase that pearl. It's not something that's going to come easy. It's going to cost all that he's got. 
the man has it put aside. He goes back and he takes out all of the other pearls that he's bought. He takes out all of his possessions and all of these other things that have become so real to him and that have become so precious to him. And he sells all of them. He gets rid of everything that he might have the price to go back and to buy that perfect pearl. Think about it. See, Jesus was illustrating a truth to us today, church. He was telling us something. He was telling us that finding a treasure and finding Jesus Christ is very similar. Because when one finds Jesus Christ, you found the greatest blessing in all the world. You found something that cannot be measured with all the other things that you possess. You found something that's higher and richer and deeper and fuller than any possession or any experience that you'll ever have in this world. Can you say amen? There are many people today with unsatisfied hungers that are outside of this world and they're searching and they're seeking. Just like that man. I believe the first man that God spoke about in this scripture. The man who was plowing in the field and who discovered this treasure. I believe that man is a picture of a man that is outside of the church. Who has never been saved. Who has never been born again. The man that found the perfect pearl is a man that is representing an individual who is inside the church. Someone who has come into the things of God to a degree. The man that is outside of the church is like many today. This fellow who found the treasure in the field is like many that are outside of that church today who have never experienced the joy and the love of Jesus Christ in their hearts. You can talk to them, I've talked to them, and you've talked to them. They're unsatisfied. They're always looking for something to do. Always looking for something to satisfy. Always looking for something good to do uh, or something uh, to have fun with. Always uh, looking for a joke. I believe in having a lot of fun and telling a joke once in a while. But listen, church, when you get a hold of God, the Lord brings you out of some of that nonsense and brings you into the fullness of His Spirit and you feast upon that. Are you listening to me? These people are always searching. Many of them are trying drugs, alcohol, every other kind of, a, of an escape to be able to find the reality of life. Life has been a disappointing experience to them. Life has been hard. They say unto themselves, I thought there was more to life than this. There must be something missing within me. Maybe if I tried drugs. Maybe if I tried sex. Maybe if I tried alcohol. Maybe if I got involved in some of the things that are going on in the world today. Because deep down inside there's something missing and they know it and they don't know what to do about it. Something wrong. Causing great problems in their life. Because listen church, inside of every person, just like a puzzle, there's created an irregular shape that nothing can fill but God. You know, people will try to fill it with everything. They'll put everything that they can in there. And they think they're having a good time. And they do for a little while. But the problem of it is that good time runs out before very long. It doesn't matter what end of life you're on. No matter who you're serving, whether you're serving God or the devil. If you're serving the devil, you're going to have troubles. If you're serving God, you're going to have troubles. But I'll tell you something. When you're serving the enemy and your life is bound and you get into problems and difficulties, you find you might feel good while you're high on your dope. And you might feel good while you're drunk and while you're up there in the air. But brother, the next morning when you come down, you feel like you've been run over by a diesel truck. But when you have Jesus Christ that can fill that irregular shape in your life, fill that spot, bring it to completeness, A man has a joy that is inside of his heart and his life that will not windle away. And even in spite of the troubles and trials, uh, even in spite of all the things that he may face, there's still a peace and a joy and a power with God that cannot be taken away. Hallelujah. Many today are looking and they're searching and they're wondering. Just like the man laboring in the field, life has been a 
hard, disappointing experience to them. Troubles on every side. They're thinking in their mind. There's got to be more to it than this. There's got to be something that will answer my questions. There's got to be something that will fulfill my needs. There's got to be something that I'm missing in this life. But though God is forgotten, He never forgets, church. I said He never forgets. There are countless thousands of people that are out there without Jesus Christ right now. They're out there in troubles and trials and disappointments and heartaches. And a lot of times I believe God allows a little more disappointment and a little more heartache to be added to them to make them search even harder for the reality of God. You know, sometimes when you get things going too well for you, you become satisfied. I said you become satisfied. God can't do the work in your life that needs to be done. He can't really form you and mold you into that place. And they're having these disappointing experiences in their life. They're seeking, they're searching. But all of a sudden, one day, some place, when they've reached a place that they know that there is no hope in themselves, there is no way that they can answer life's problems, sometimes a person has to come completely to the bottom, thinking, I don't know which way to turn. There must be a better way than this this right there before them there it is jesus hallelujah a treasure that's hid in a field a treasure that has been right there all the time where they were laboring but they had never discovered it they never found it it's been right there hallelujah jesus one that can forgive sins one who can take away the burdens of life from that individual one who can mend up that broken heart and give them joy and peace within and they find it and they see it and they know that this is the only answer to the life that they've been living Then we find the man who sought goodly pearls. This man found many pearls. He had many in his collection and they were very, very important to him. And he loved them. But he was still seeking one. He was still seeking another pearl that was perfect. You see, this man is likened to the man that is in the church. He knows what it is to go to church. He has heard the gospel message of God and Jesus Christ preached. He has the pearl of church attendance. He has the pearl of giving in the offering plate. He has the pearl of spending even his two minutes in the altars before him. He has those pearls within his life and they're important to him and they do bring some satisfaction. He gets a certain amount of satisfaction out of going to church and he goes away feeling like, well, I've done my my best. I, God, I've done what you want me to do. I've been to your house tonight. He gets a satisfaction out of putting some money in the offering plate. That pearl means something to him because he can say, God, I support your work. I give to your cause. He gets satisfaction out of helping and instructing the lives of the people that are around about him. Because he can say, Lord, I'm concerned about your saints. I have done these things for you. These pearls are important to him and they're precious to him. But he's still lacking one of perfection. Now, I'm going to be honest with you tonight, church. I've found a lot of Pentecostals in that state. Some of them that want to really get out and do something for God. And some of them that want to do this and that. But they know they're lacking. And it's very obvious they're lacking. All you have to do is look at their life and you can see they're lacking. Something missing. It isn't there. One minute they're on fire with God. The next minute they're not. They haven't cut loose all of these things uh, of this life and they still keep doing all these. Oh, it doesn't hurt me. I can go ahead and do it and belong to God. You mean to tell me I can't do this and be a Christian? I can't do that and be a Christian. It doesn't matter what you can or what you can't do and be a Christian. 
is how much are you going to consecrate your life to God? You see, the point doesn't really lie on what one man told me. He said, do you mean to tell me? He said a word that I didn't like. And I corrected him. How many have ever been guilty of doing that? He come out with that terrible word and I said, look, brother, I said, maybe you don't mind blurting out with that kind of garbage, but I said, I don't like to hear it. So I said, please refrain from it for me, would you? And I was paying him to do what he did, so I thought I had a right to say it. He said, you mean to tell me that that word that I said is going to send me to hell? I said, I don't know whether the word's going to send you there or not, but your attitude is. Because you're not consecrated to God. You haven't given your life to God. You're lost without Jesus Christ. Too many people are putting emphasis upon a thing or upon a word or an action or something they do, rather upon the fact that they give their all to God. I could go out and get drunk tonight and sober up tomorrow and say, Lord, forgive me, and if the rapture came, I might go to heaven. I said, might? I might. But the fact remains is, if I did that, I wouldn't be consecrating or giving myself to God. I don't want to do that. I don't want to. It's not the alcohol, it's me. Marijuana plant growing out in the field has got some benefit. I don't know what it is, but it's got to be here. God wouldn't put it there. But he didn't intend on people grinding it up and puffing it down into their lungs and going around acting like fools on the weed. Come on. Now, the weed's not wrong. It's the person that does it. Come on. Some people say theater's not wrong. I can tell I'm already starting to meddle. <laughs> Amen. But I'll tell you this, there's more corruption come out of the theater than any one place that I know of. Say, so, well, there's good things. That's true, but you get watching the good things and it isn't long you go check out the bad ones too. Just want to see what it's all about, you know. That's it. I can be more effective for God if I know what's going on. Come on. Someone told me about Billy Graham putting on a wig and sunglasses. and So he does that all the time. Puts on a wig and sunglasses and he goes down into these rock concerts and places like that so he can know what's going on. I said, well, if Billy Graham wants to do that, praise God for Billy Graham. Hallelujah. I don't have to go down there to know what's going on. I know what's going on by living clean for Jesus. Hallelujah. I know it's the devil. I know it's his power. I know exactly what he's doing. And I know how to combat him by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I don't have to go down and partake of his ways and ideas to be able to fight him either. And that's why there's some that are in the house of God who have claimed to do a work for God, but they have never really been completely released to Jesus because of the fact they have not consecrated their all to God. And this is what God wants of your life. He wants more than anything else. He wants you. Man told me one time, he says, you know, some brother messenger said, I've given a lot to God. He says, I, I've given this. I've given, he named off the money. I've given my time. I've labored. I said, brother, you've left out the most important thing of all. He said, what? I said, the one thing that God wants more than anything, you refuse to give. He says, what's that? I said, it's yourself. Well, he said, I give of myself. I said, when it's convenient. But when it's not convenient, you do what you pretty well please. And that's not consecration. This man found certain amount of pleasure in the things that he did. You know, there's a lot of people that will come and associate themselves with a moving church just because it relieves them a little bit of the anxieties and the fears of the hereafter.
of that than when you put oil and water in a barrel. It never becomes apart. It always separates. Amen. This man finds pleasure in his works. He has the pearl of works. He's labored. He's done many things in this area, but he is still lacking something in his heart, and he knows it. Something there that hasn't been fulfilled. Something there that hasn't been satisfied. Something there that he has not been able to put his finger on, but he knows that he's missing. He knows that he's lacking, and he doesn't know what to do about it. One thing I can say about this man, I appreciate the honesty of his spirit. There's a lot of people know what to do about it, but they're just too darn stubborn to do it. Amen. Come on, I said, Brother Mister, you said darn. That's right, I did. And it's the truth. Amen. Don't sit there and give me that Prescott look. They know what to do. They won't do it. At least this man had a desire in his heart for the, 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 the perfect life for the thing that he was missing. He knew something was wrong and he was seeking it. You know, it's one thing not to have it and you haven't been confronted with it yet, but God help the man that's confronted with it every day and still goes on his merry way. One day this brother, searching... He'd been through marketplaces. He had bought many pearls. He'd gone place after place. He had all of these things that he had done. But you know, one day he went into a different marketplace. He happened to stumble into one of those Pentecostals. <laughs> Come on. Hallelujah. He went in there and all of a sudden it hit him right between the eyes. There it is! The thing that he had sought for, the thing that he had prayed for, the thing that he longed for more than anything else. And I thought about that last night after the service. A fella came up to me last night, very down to business, introduced himself, shook my hand, said, I'm so and so from Tucson. Glad to meet you, and I want you to know that I'm here, and I ain't never seen anything like this in all my life. He said, I am a Baptist. I said, well, God bless you, brother. The Lord loves a Baptist, too. Well, I know that, but he said, we sure missing something. He said, I've never seen... Why, well, he said, you were touching those people, and wham, they were falling down. Now, he said, I was right there where I could see it. And he said, you weren't pushing on them. Some power was hitting them. And he said, the power that I felt in this place was good, brother. This must be God. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said, when are you going to come to Tucson? <laughs> I said, I just left there two weeks ago. <laughs> well, I didn't hear anything about it. I said, well, I'm sorry about that. But I said, I told him, it's a little church just off 6th Street down there. Gave him the directions to it. Said, it's called the door. And I said, they know about it. Go down there and you get zapped. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I said, maybe I'll be back there before long again. Praise God. You see, this man was confronted with something that he had never seen before. Something that was totally new. I'm sure that he was sincere in his heart with what he was doing and what he had, but he was seeking something from God that he had not yet received. Hallelujah. And when he was confronted with it, he was ready to grab onto it because he saw the reality of the power of Jesus Christ. Oh, I'll tell you, I get so stirred, church. Brother, I've lacked things in my life. There's been times when I was missing something as far as a person myself. There were times when I, I knew that I needed to get a hold of God. When I knew that I was lacking. Uh, when I knew that I got up to preach, the whole congregation sat out there and snored and nothing happened and, and everything was wrong. I knew it. I'll tell you something. I was hungry. And I was dissatisfied. And I was getting before God and I said, God, I'm not going to go on like this anymore. And let me tell you this here and now. You can't be 
among a group of Pentecostal believers and powerful people and say, well, I see where it's at. It's in the shout. And you can shout. And you'll be just as flat as you were before you shouted. There's more than shout involved with serving Jesus, church. It takes a consecration of your life. It takes a separation. It takes a coming aside and getting alone in your prayer closet and beginning to cry out to God and beginning to seek the face of the Lord that the Spirit of God may move upon you and that God may cause you to come to the reality of the power of God through prayer, seeking Jesus, offering yourself completely that He may release His power and His Spirit upon you and you can go forth and do the works that His Son even than dead. Hallelujah. You know, there's so many times in prayer when I felt the presence of God to such a degree that, man, I've had to pray and say, God, you got to stop it. I don't think I can take no more. Amen. And I know that's foolish because God knows what we can take and what we can stand and what we can't. But I'm saying all that to say this. There comes a time when we have to separate ourselves. You know, a man told me not too long ago, pastor, a pastor. And he said, you know, brother, you get so involved, pastory. You get so wrapped up doing the works of God. And he says, you just don't really have time to get out and pray. And he said, that disturbed me and I prayed about it. And he says, I just kind of got a witness from the Lord that I can pray while I'm driving my car. I can pray while I'm uh, doing some of these things and running and making a call on somebody else or going to the hospital. I can pray. I said, brother, God didn't give you that witness. He said, what do you mean? I said, I mean, the devil did. He didn't like that very well. Said, what do you mean? I said, you can pray while you're driving your car. You can pray while you're making a hospital call. You can pray while you're going down the street. But that'll never take the place of you getting alone by yourself. And when you shut yourself alone with God there, begin to cry out to God and let the Spirit of the Lord begin to minister to the inner parts of your life and begin to strengthen you. Hallelujah. The Bible says, in all they're doing, they sought not the Lord. And all they're doing, they sought not the Lord. Do you realize that it's possible to shut God out of your life by works, even good works? And how important it is to recognize where the true source of power is. That pearl without a flaw. That pearl of absolute perfection. The very thing that can bring the satisfaction to your heart and to your life. I think Mary and Martha were a good example of that. As Mary sat at the feet of Jesus, the other waited on tables. She became so angry with her sister saying, Lord, why do I have to do all the work? Why do I have to run the tables while she sits there at your feet? Jesus spoke to her. He said, she has chosen the wise way to live. She has sought the Master. You know, it's so easy to become involved in God's work. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, you can even get so involved witnessing that you can forget to pray. Don't you misunderstand me, brother. I believe we need to witness. People need to be taught and hear the message of God. But I'll tell you one thing. You don't just stop at the witness. Jesus said, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses. When are you going to be witnesses? After the Holy Ghost has come upon you. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Paul said, I die every day. I seek a renewing. A strengthening in my life each day. Brother, there's a time of prayer and supplication and calling out to God that must go before everything that you do for God if you're going to be effective. 
And when you have the power and the authority of God upon your life, then you can stand and minister the Word of God in authority and effectiveness. And men and women will know the reality of Jesus Christ because it's not in the flesh, it's in the Spirit. It's something that will bring forth a joy. I'll tell you, I've discovered the most fulfilling and gratifying life upon the face of the earth, and that's being obedient to God, following in the footsteps of my Savior, doing those things that He would lay upon my life. There isn't anything like it in the world, church. Nothing. Not a spirit. Not a feeling. There isn't anything can measure up to the fulfillment that God gives me in delivering my soul in His Holy Spirit. That blesses me, church. You know, I feel like God's speaking to hearts right now. You say, well, God's called me to do this, or God's spoken to me to do that, fine, but you better let Him trim a little bit of the excess off. You better let Him get a hold of you. You better let Him get you into the closet. You better let Him turn you around and begin to shape and mold and form your life into the life that He wants you to be before you can be used. Hallelujah. The Spirit of God in the way that He wants to use you. This man discovered it. The answer, the thing that he had sought for, there it was in Jesus. Now the thing that I noticed was so prominent out of this whole Scripture, the thing that seemed to be so outstanding in this parable was that both parties, Both the man outside of the church, that man that was plowing in the field, and the man that was seeking goodly pearls, both parties at the end of the story went out and sold all that they had. They got rid of all their possessions that they might be able to obtain the treasure because the treasure was worth it. Are you listening? The treasure was worth it. Hallelujah. They sold it all. They willingly gave of themselves and all their possessions. They laid them upon the line that they might have that treasure that they had found. It was greater than all the other possessions that they possessed. I've often thought what would happen that man who had been plowing in the field found a treasure, went back to his house and sat down and began to think about it and thought, well, it's a nice treasure. It could do a lot of things, but I kind of like it the way I am. This old sofa that I sat on and I've been on there for so long, I couldn't bear to give it up. Sell this. Got a corner gone where the cat had chewed on it. Kind of sentimental. Come on. That old picture that's been hanging on the wall for so long, I couldn't dare get rid of that. That table that we've had for so long, I couldn't give it up. Why it means so much to me. We've sat around there as a family, the kids and all of us together. Why couldn't get rid of that thing? Brother, I don't think the thought even crossed his mind. In light of becoming a millionaire, those worthless pieces of junk that he had in his house was nothing. He would have sold those and the clothes on his back to be able to get the amount of money that he needed to buy the field. Likewise, the man who found the pearl would have sold all that he had in order to be able to purchase that pearl at perfect price because the treasure was worth it. I said the treasure was worth it. And I'll tell you something, church, there isn't anything in all this world that is worth what Jesus Christ is to your life. I don't care what it costs you. I don't care how sentimental it is. I don't care whether you think you can do it and be a Christian or not. 
I can still do this and be a Christian. I can still go here and serve God. I can still do that and be a Christian. God knows my heart. I'm mature enough. I'm spiritual enough that I can get away with it. Been a thousand like you that have said it before you did. Every drug addict that's on the needle always tells himself, I'm going to be the one that don't have to get hooked on this thing. I'll get away with it. Every alcoholic that's walking down the street, he tells himself, I'm the one that's not going to get hooked. Not me. I'm mature enough. I can handle it. In fact, he's telling himself up that the day he lands on Skid Row. I'm not hooked. I just like it. That's a real cop-out. Come on. Heard people say, well, I'm not hooked on that. I don't have to do it. I just enjoy it. Brother, if you really see the value of the life that you have in Christ Jesus, and if you recognize how much it really means to you as a person, if you know that God is real and that Christ has changed your life, and you see what it means to you as an individual, you're not going to let anything stand in your way. You're going to sacrifice your all, be willing to put it all upon the altar, and lay yourself before God that you might obtain the perfectness of the life in Christ Jesus. That's going to be the most important thing to you in the world. And it's not a fact of whether you can or whether you can't do a certain thing and be a Christian. It's your attitude in the whole thing. Somebody that loves God wants to give up all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I had a friend of mine that just got saved in our church and he was riding down the highway with me in a car and he said, you know, Brother Messer, he said, God did so much for me. He said, he changed my life. He said, I used to go into those filthy movie screens, some of these pictures that they show. He said, you know, I went in and they, he told me one time what one of those things was showing. And I'll tell you, I said, brother, don't tell me no more. I almost had to stop stop the car and get out and bomb it on the street. Just hearing it. I said, I don't even want to hear it. I might be mature enough to handle it, but brother, you get that stuff in your head and it'll just run and hound you to death. Work upon your mind. You need to have your mind cleansed and separated and purified by offering your all to God and putting all these things in the past and saying, Lord, I'm going to separate myself to you now and I'm going all the way for God. And nothing's going to stop me or hinder me. The disciples left all they had and followed Jesus. It was an illustration too. Leaving everything they possessed behind, their works, their occupations, and everything they had just to follow Jesus Christ. Paul said, it may be a difficult life, but I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Hallelujah. I count all things but loss. Even my education, all I've learned, I count it but done for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. That to me is more important than all these other things that I've learned over the years. Hallelujah. I believe that if we are willing to submit our heart to God tonight and our lives to Jesus, there isn't nothing that God can't or won't do in your heart and your life if you just yield to Him. Do you believe it? Would you pray with me? Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of His Holy Spirit and the anointing of God, I pray and I bind every work of the devil that would hinder the minds of God's people. And may these minds be freed uh, right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, speak to those hearts. Uh, draw them by your power. Uh, God, minister to those who need Jesus Christ in their heart and their life. That they may feel the love and the anointing of Jesus pouring out upon them. In ministering to their needs right now. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We see two men in the Old Test in the New Testament. One man was stoned, but died praying for the ones that stoned him.
with the joy of Jesus Christ in his heart. And the men that were doing the stoning, they gnashed with their teeth. They cried out as though they were in pain. It seems as though this whole thing was reversed. Stephen should have been the one gnashing with his teeth. Stephen should have been the one crying out in pain. But instead, he said, I see Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. It were those who were opposing that was feeling the anxiety of this thing. The other man we see in the New Testament was a rich young ruler. One died praying for the people that stoned him with joy in his heart. The other was a rich young ruler. He had everything that he wanted. Everything that he could possess. But he lacked that one perfect thing. Jesus said, all these things that you've done, but yet one thing thou lackest, sell all that you have. Give up. Get rid of yourself and of the things that you count so worthy and do it for my name's sake. And this young man walked away sorrowful because he had great possessions. I don't believe the possessions were the sin. I believe that the fact that those things meant more to him than God, that was the problem. It is time that we become willing to sacrifice and to offer ourselves completely to Jesus. While we're praying right now, there are those of you here. You don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're lost. You're bound for a devil's hell. It's no accident that you've come to this place. You didn't just happen to be invited or stumble in. The Spirit of the Lord has drawn you here that God might give you the Word of God that you may hear the preaching of the Word and that the Holy Spirit might convict you and that you might come to Jesus. Right now, you can see that treasure. You can find that pearl. You can find the joy of living. And you've seen it on the faces of these people that are around you. You've seen them rejoice. You've seen the peace in their heart and the joy that they've got that they didn't used to have. And you can't deny it. You might want to excuse it, but you can't deny it. They've got it, brother. There's something there. You can have it too. I challenge you, everybody that's honest with God right now, be willing to say, Brother Messer, I know that I need to get right with Jesus. I need to be a Christian. I want to give my life to God. I want to be saved. Would you just lift up your hand quickly? Slip it up. Pray for me. Come on. It takes courage, I know. But that's the only kind of people God can use. He don't want no cowards in His army. He needs men, women, that are willing to step out and say, Yes, Lord, I know that I need something and I'm willing to get it. Man could have sat down by his treasure, forgot the whole thing, and missed out on the greatest opportunity of his life. Some of the greatest opportunities that you ever have may pass you but one time. And if you don't seize that opportunity while it's there, you can miss it. And alter the course of your whole life. God's speaking to you now. Would you slip up your hand quickly? I know it. I know it just sure as I'm here. There's a brother God's speaking to Very heavily, I can feel it in my own soul right now. Man, God's convicting. And you're not right with God. You know you're not right with God. I know you're not right with God. And the Holy Spirit knows it. And He's working on you. And He wants you to submit your life to Jesus. Just slip up your hand. Come on, quickly. We're not going to take a lot of time. But I feel the power of God moving in this place. Slip it up and slip it down. Say, pray for me. Pray for me. I want to be saved. Yes, I see your hand. Are there others? Come on. I know I'm not right with God, but I want to be. And I desire your prayers. Would you remember me in your prayers? Lift it up. We're going to sing that chorus. Oh, singing hallelujah, hallelujah, praise and glory to His name. As we sing it, I want you to remain the attitude of prayer just the way you are now. And I want those that lifted your hand, if 
God's speaking to your heart, you just come on. If you did not lift your hand and you know you should have, I challenge you to slip out of your seat. And if there's someone near you that doesn't know God and you know they need to get right with God, I challenge you, get hold of them and say, come on, brother. Come on, sister, we'll go with you. We'll go together. Bring them down here. God's dealing with hearts right now, church. I can't force you to lift your hand. I can't force you to move out of your seat. All I can do is give you the message and the opportunity. What you do with it is up to you. But I tell you, don't turn it aside. It's the greatest thing that will ever happen to you tonight is to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. To come to the knowledge of His saving power. As we sing it right now, I want you to come. All those God's dealing with, come on, wherever you are. Singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise and glory to His name. Oh, singing hallelujah. Hallelujah, praise and glory to His name. Sing it again. Oh, singing hallelujah. Hallelujah, praise and glory to His name. singing hallelujah hallelujah praise and glory to his name oh we're going to sing it again I just can't help but feel there's someone missing God in fact I not only feel it I know it I challenge you to make you stand for God. One day these words are going to ring in your face. One day you're going to see this thing all over again and you're going to say, why didn't I make that stand? Would to God I would have heard and answered? Then it'll be too late. Jesus is speaking to you now. Glory to God. Sing it again. Singing hallelujah, hallelujah, praise and glory to His name. Oh, singing hallelujah, And glory to His name. Lift your hands and sing it to Him. Oh, sing it. Glory. Hallelujah. Praise. And glory to His name. Oh, sing it. Hallelujah, hallelujah, praise and glory to His name. Glory to God. Now we're going to sing that chorus again, and I believe that God is making and putting forth an appeal to consecrate. This is one of the things that the Lord is doing right now. This is the type of services that God is conducting tonight. And I feel there are those, and I challenge you, we're going to sing it again. Those of you here that have been in the house of God, and you're willing to say, Brother Messer, I found great peace in what I have done. But I realize that there's something there yet that I have not tapped onto. Something there that I haven't gotten a hold of. I'm seeking for something that will satisfy all of my desires. And I want to submit myself to God... You know, I get so sick and tired, if I can use that expression, church. I hear this old garbage and it just rubs right up the back of my neck. I can 